Before we go into the sermon, I just wanted to, an announcement. Uh, Barry Schroeder has, for the last couple, three years, had a, down in the park an opportunity for people to read the Bible. And they're going to read the entire Bible out loud under one of the picnic stands down there, or the shelters. And so you have an opportunity to be part of that. Um, you, you read for about 10 minutes. Um, don't worry about if you can read well or not. It's not about that. It comes from the heart, right? Amen? And so if you want to, between August 12th and the 17th, during that time, if you wanted to call Barry and talk with him or sign up and take 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever, maybe the whole family would like to take a part, um, talk to him. I have a phone number for you if you want to talk to Barry. I know Jay is here, and he was kind of promoting this also, so um, we'll make sure that we get your name in there. So I encourage you to do that if you'd like to. Just another way of demonstrating who Christ is in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. Tonight's sermon is titled Rock Bottom or Bedrock. Rock Bottom or Bedrock. You know, if you've lived around Detroit Lakes long enough, anyone here live on the lake? Okay. I'm guessing when you bought your lot, one of the key components to that lot or that house was what the, what the shore was like. Is it muddy? Is it weedy? Is it sandy? Or is it rocky? And so if you've been around anyone that seems to be looking for a lake lot or a lake home, sooner or later it will come up in the conversation. If you were a realtor, you'd hear it all the time. What's the shore like? What's the shore like? We happened to be over by Eagle Lake today, and I happened to see that the shore where we were at was rocky. Not, not chunky rocky, just nice and smooth, but it was kind of laid out, almost like it was paved. And so what we're talking about tonight is that we're talking about rock bottom, and sometimes you'll hear it related to the lake. Now, we go fishing up in Canada by Morrison, and up there, if you've ever fished in Lake of the Woods, it's nothing but rock for the most part. You'll find a few sandy spots or whatnot, but for the most part, it is rocky. It is not smooth rocky, it is jagged rock. Sometimes there's a six, eight foot boulder and you can see it in the depth finder come and go up and you go up and over and you can feel it on the weight of your, your rod and it goes up and over and drops back down on the other side. But the trick is when you fish up in Canada that you can't let it hit the bottom for very long because you'll hear the word snag. Anyone ever go fishing up in Canada? Anyone ever snag? Oh, I tell you, it's a horrific feeling the first year I went up, you know, they have to teach you how to fish up there because it's just different. Like here, I would like to cast out behind the pontoon, you know, set the line, put it in the pole, and then grab a pop and maybe a sandwich, you know, a six foot sub, and troll around while I fish. You do that up there, and within about 30 seconds, your rod's going to go bang into the water because you'll snag. And so what happens is you've got three or four people in the boat and you're usually trolling forward. You can be trolling backward and your goal is to cover as much ground as you can. And so everyone's fishing and they've got all their line out and they've got the, the, you know, the depth finders going and usually the trolling motors going and everyone's having a fun time until somebody says, snag. Because then you all have to reel all your lines up and everyone reel up. You all get your lines up, and then he gets back and he maneuvers the boat back around to where you were because he looks at your string because by now you've got 3,000 yards out. And you, why do we keep pulling like that? It's really a fish, right? And so you have to turn around, go back, and usually if you come to the back side of it, it'll pop free and away you go again. But you hate the snag thing because it slows everybody up or it causes them to turn around. But it's just part of it. It's because it's a rocky bottom. So you need to be careful that you don't snag. Now, we're talking about rocky bottoms in the lake, but how many of you know in life that we come outside of life, or we come up out of the water, and we can hit rock bottom, but now it's in life. Now, we can sit here and talk about hitting rock bottom, and a lot of us have stories, and a lot of us have experienced, but it's a place that we don't want to be. When you're fishing in the lake in Canada, you want to be near the bottom. But in life, we don't necessarily want to be near the bottom. We want to win. We want to be victorious. We want to have a victorious life, prayfully in Christ, not on your own power. And so to be rock bottom or to say, I hit rock bottom, most of us know what that means. That something maybe major has happened or you've lost so many different things that you feel like you can't go any lower in life. I'll just ask, anyone ever feel like you've been at rock bottom? I sure have. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not a fun place to be. And oftentimes it's like looking up and you feel like you're so far down, right? You're so far down that you look up 
and you can barely see light. It's like you're at the end of a tornado that's a three miles long, and you can see some light up there, but it seems almost hopeless. I'll never be able to climb out of this rock bottom. But we all know that Jesus Christ can help us to do that. But we struggle with that, and there are a lot of people that are struggling with it now, even today. We want to be champions. The football team, at the, before the big game with the Super Bowl, he doesn't say, you know, come on, guys, let's see if we can lose this one. I want to win this one. I've never had a coach uh, talk to me about losing, except when he said, Brian, you lost, you know, that race or whatever it might be, but they want to win. Society says that we need to win, and there's nothing wrong with striving to do well with something, but it's built in us that we usually want to do well in our relationships. Your boy just said his vows yesterday, for better or worse, and he didn't say, oh, it's worse. We want the better. We don't want the worse. And so we come to realize that in relationships, we want to be victorious. Uh, as parents, we want to be victorious in raising our children. We want our children to be victorious. In business, we usually say, let's try to stay afloat. Now, I've shared that Sandy and I have been in many livestock adventures, and we buy high, sell low. <laughs> buy high, sell low, until we go out of business. So we aren't very victorious when it comes to that. We enjoy it. It's fun. But... This whole idea of being victorious, we strive to be that. So when you hear the word rock bottom, or you feel like you're at rock bottom, it's usually not a comfortable place to be. It's somewhere where we don't usually want to be. John 10.10 10 speaks about life and life more abundantly, Jesus says. That sounds like a victorious life. Not just life, not just living life, but living a victorious life in Jesus Christ. So many of us will leave here today and we'll live life. Oh, we'll bump through Monday and we'll bump through Tuesday and maybe we'll have an up day on Wednesday and then we'll kind of roll through Thursday and then Friday comes and it's the weekend's coming and we can get through Friday. Then we've got the weekend and usually we get a little bit uplifted. But Jesus talks about an abundant life, a life with him where there's peace and joy and love. All these things that lift us up, all these things that can take us from rock bottom, or we come to realize that I don't care if I'm on rock bottom because that's not the bottom. Instead of rock bottom, I want to be a dead rock. I want to be built up on Jesus Christ. And so if we can surrender that, if we can keep that idea in mind, sometimes if we're where we don't necessarily want to be financially or our home or whatever it is, if we come to realize that Jesus Christ wants to give us an abundant life, if you'll grab onto that, you'll never hit rock bottom. Paul talks about so many times when he was in peril and, you know, hit with rods 39 times, a few times, almost drowns, in prisons, different things like that. Yet he would have never said, I'm at rock bottom. In fact, when they were down in that prison, they sang hymns. See, it wasn't about what he had. It wasn't about his situation. It wasn't about his emotions. It was about that he was serving Jesus Christ and believed in Jesus Christ and put his trust in Jesus Christ. And guess what? He never hit rock bottom. If we will plant our mind and plant our, our spiritual concerns in the right place, it necess necessarily matter what takes place. Now, the other day we had huge winds. How many locks trees? Yes. Life brings us those kind of winds sometimes. But if we'll focus on Jesus Christ, if we'll stand strong on that bedrock, if we'll build our house on the rock, the winds may come, but yet it doesn't matter if the house blows away. Because our relationship with Jesus Christ is so much more. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, The Lord said, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Does it sound like he wants his children to be rock bottom? Not at all. He's got great plans. I wish sometimes we would have the same desire to give ourselves a future and a hope in Christ. It's right there before us, but oftentimes we don't grab onto it, and oftentimes you live at rock bottom for so long that all you do is head off this way, or you head off that way, but you never head up to Christ. In other words, we get used to the dysfunction. We get used to the despair. We get used to the addiction, the abuse, all these different things, and so it keeps us down, and before long we might surrender and say, you know what, Satan, you win. You beat me down so long, I'm tired of fighting. Yet if we read the word, Jesus says he wants to give us an abundant life, that he wants to give us a future and a hope. But our hope comes in Jesus Christ. 
Too many times if we set Jesus Christ on the shelf and try to deal with life and all the situations that come before long, we'll find ourselves hitting rock bottom spiritually, and oftentimes we never strive to get it back. Now, when you go fishing in Canada, you've got some help. You've got a depth locator, and, and the guy, if he's a good captain, you know, while you're trolling, he'll say, it's coming up. Okay, it's going back down. Oh, big rock, pull up, pull up, pull up. Oh, it's going back down. You can drop it down. He kind of gives you a heads up as to what's coming and taking place. So if you're going to be coming in the shallows, reel in some so you don't drag it out there and get snagged. And so you have depth locators. You've got a captain that helps you. And we've got these bottom bouncers. I brought one in today. It's a bottom bouncer. Most people have maybe seen them. The line goes here, and the lure comes off the back with a crawler or something like that on a leech, and usually a gold spoon, hammered spoon, that's what's big up there. But then it has this little tail that comes out from the weight. And so what your goal is to do is as you're coming along that you would touch down, and when you would feel that tip touch, you would pull it up slightly. Come back down to pull it up slightly to avoid this weight getting down into the rocks in a snag. And so you've got a tool that you can use to help you stay out of trouble. Well, Brian, that's great. Really great. Thanks for the fishing story and the tips. But I don't fish. Jesus Christ can help us stay out of the rocks. If we'll follow Jesus Christ and his, his teachings, and if we'll strive to have the Holy Spirit be with us and guide us and counsel us as we walk through life, you can avoid getting snagged on the rocks. See, we've got the help, but will we accept it? You probably heard the story about the guy that was a, it was a flood and he was sitting on a roof. You probably heard this one. Sit, and you, maybe you'll even like this one. He's sitting on a roof and the guy's, and he says, Lord, Lord, you've got to save me. You've got to save me. Well, pretty soon a boat comes by and he says, you know, can I help you? And he's like, no, no, just go on. I've been praying. The Lord's going to save me. Pretty soon another boat comes by and another boat. Finally, he's crying out at the end of the night. He said, Lord, I thought you would save me. And he said, I sent you four boats. Will we accept the help that Jesus Christ wants to give us? If, if the Holy Spirit will reside in us and counsel us and guide us, will we accept that counsel? Will we reach out and say, help me avoid rock bottom? You're so honest. And a lot of times we don't seem to strive to do that. Now, I looked at the word snag, and it's just interesting because here's all the, I believe it's verbs that go with it. Uh, complication. Let, just see if you have a snag in your life. A complication, difficulty, catch, hitch, hiccup, obstacle, hurdle, disadvantage, stumbling block, pitfall, problem, uh, impediment, hindrance, a downside. Anyone? Oh, the hands go up. Absolutely. Life seems to be up and down sometimes. Now, Psalms 19, 7, 11 helps us to stay off the bottom. Let me read this to you. Psalms 19, 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Remember we talked about how we get saved, spiritually we get saved, but our spiritual side has to also affect our soul side, our emotions and all those things. And so it says, the Lord is what? Perfect. Can you get better than perfect? Then why do we look for so many other things? Why do we disregard His word so often? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, that much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Wow. And you got a bottom monster. you got a captain yelling out the depths. Jesus Christ has wrote a book, a book full of things that if you will follow and plant into your life and strive to live, we can avoid ever hitting rock bottom. We can avoid all this disadvantages and stumbling blocks and all those things. It doesn't mean they aren't going to come, but we'll react differently. We'll handle them much differently so they aren't quite as large in our life and they're not quite as intense. God will give us a peace to be able to work through it or to gain wisdom to how best to handle this situation versus going, you know, the knee-jerk reaction, which you often hear it called. I want to go to 2 Samuel 11. Because we're going to talk about two guys and some examples from their life. Now, the first one we're going to talk about in uh, 2 Samuel 11, starting in verse 1, is David. Anyone ever heard of David in the Bible? 
Man, I tell you what, he was anointed to be king. You know, he beat down the giant when no one else would go. He would, you know, he took on Goliath. Uh, he was shown favor to Saul. He became the king. He was successful king with God. But then comes chapter 11. How many of you have a living life and you're trying to live it for Christ and you feel like, I think I finally got this thing figured out. I, I seem to be rolling rather smoothly here. It seems like I'm absorbing it and you know I'm following this, this statutes and his teachings. And you know what? My life seems to be leveling out. And there she is, Bathsheba. Boom, chaka, boom, chaka, boom, chaka, boom, chaka, boom. Actually, that isn't right. She was doing nothing wrong except bathing. It was David that made some choices to follow temptation. And so we're just going to read a couple verses, and we're going to more or less just talk through this. It happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. And so David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him and lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I'm with child. So we know this is over a little bit of an extended time, but here's what's taking place. In the summertime, in those days, it was war season. And so in the spring, the guys would all pile up and they would, you know, have people stay behind, the kids and the women and whatnot, to tend to the sheep and all those sort of things, and the guys would go off to war. Now, they might go off to war for a while, then they come home and maybe have a sandwich and, you know, talk to the kids and whatnot, and have a shower and change clothes, and then go back to war again. Usually the king was out there with them, but David chose to stay home. How many of you know sometimes when you have too much time on your hands, things get a little bit sticky? So here we have David, and he sees this woman who's bathing, which, you know, it would be great if she chose to bathe inside the house, but she was outside the house. She wasn't doing anything wrong. He happened to see her. That's not wrong. It's when he began to inquire about her that the slippery slide began, that downward spiral towards rock bottom. And what happens is when you're on that downward spiral, oftentimes you continue to make choices that don't help the situation, but it exactly hurt it. A sin or a lie begets another sin and a lie, and then you've got to sin and lie again, and then you've got to try to cover that up because you don't want anyone to know. And so then you go ahead and murder her husband, more or less, because you want to hide the adultery and that this is your child. And before long, it sure seems like he's at rock bottom. Anyone ever been there? You don't have to admit that. I was there many years ago. I was suicidal to the point of coming up with a plan, figuring out how I could take care of this. Because the choices I had made brought me down and down and down. And the farther you come from Christ, I wasn't saved at this time, but the farther you come from Christ, the lighter and dimmer His power is in your life. You ever notice that? The farther you walk from Christ, how much easier it is to sin. The conviction seems to disappear. And then if you sin enough, before long you have no conviction at all. Before long, Satan says, this is fun stuff, ain't it? If you keep going with me, I'm going to give you more of this good stuff. Before long, we head off to deep despair. Now, I was suicidal not because of I, I felt like I was at rock bottom. I knew I was at rock bottom. I felt suicidal because I knew I had got myself there, and I didn't see any way that I could change my behavior or change who I was to get out of it. But I didn't know Jesus Christ. And so now when I talk with people that feel the same way I did, I can share about Jesus Christ before they hit rock bottom or before they decide to go even further to get themselves off of rock bottom on their own. Now I share that story with you not to uh, you know, shock you or anything like that because I'll guarantee you there's people sitting out here that have felt that same way. Satan smiles when he's got us on rock bottom. He's almost ready to stick the fork in because we're almost done. But we have Jesus Christ. We have Jesus Christ in His words. The Bibles, you know, there was millions and billions of them sold, but I wasn't saved. I didn't know about that. And I didn't have anyone speaking Christ into my life at that time. But prayfully and thankfully, Jesus Christ saved my life. And it wasn't long after that I discovered Jesus Christ. Satan wanted to do me in before I found Christ. You know that? He's out there doing battle all the time. 
The problem is, is we aren't out doing battle enough, my friends. So I hit rock bottom. Some of you had hit rock bottom. David was hitting rock bottom. So then he sins, and then Nathan has to come and kind of prophesy and tell him a story and, and point out his sin, that God saw your sin. God knows what you're doing, and, and David's frustrated, and before long he has to confess that he's done wrong, but God says, you know what, I will forgive you because you've confessed it and desire to change who you are, but your son must die. Oftentimes there's consequences for our choices. Sometimes we don't think it affects anybody but us. What's the big deal? It's just me doing this. But it might affect your spouse and your children and your friends and your church and your job. We just don't know. And so we keep in mind that David had done this and had to pay a consequence for it. But he never hit solid rock bottom because he was a man after God's own heart. And Jesus Christ forgave him because he had the right kind of heart. God said, you know what? You've got a heart that you can learn from your mistakes. Can we learn from our mistakes? Some of us keep making the same ones over and over again. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Again, it's probably the stronghold idea. Psalms 51, I want to read you some of Psalms 51. Psalms 51, David wrote during the midst of all this turmoil and coming out on the other side, close to rock bottom, but God saved him. Let me just read a few verses. Verse 1 says, Have mercy upon me, O God according to your loving kindness. Has any of us ever said that in our quiet time? Knowing that we're struggling with sin, knowing that we've sinned during the week or we've just done something horrific. Have we ever said, Lord, have mercy upon me according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. If I go to verse 10, <laughs> Again, he says, blot out my iniquities. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners shall be converted to you. Have any of us said those sort of things lately to God? Have we really got down and said, Lord, i got to confess, and you know what? After I confess, then I need to seek your forgiveness. And I understand who you are, God. I understand your loving kindness. I understand that you want to forgive me, and I want to truly receive it. I want to truly receive it. I want to change. I want you to truly create in me a clean heart. I'm sick of the strongholds. I'm sick of saying I'm never going to do that again. Before long, I'm doing it again. And I get so mad and so full of shame and so full of guilt because I said I would never do that again because I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And here I am in the muck and the mire again. I'm up rock bottom. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord. Erase this stuff from me. Clean me up. Help me to help myself with you, Lord. Move forward. If you're at rock bottom, please get sick of it. Be sick of being at rock bottom. Be sick of not living an abundant life for Jesus Christ. Because if you will live a, a life that Christ has for you, then we can truly be disciples and go out there and get the millions that don't know what we already know. we got room in this church for more. If we had to do 20 services a day, we'll do it. So if you go out there and out in the harvest field and get somebody, fantastic. Now you'll say, well, the harvest isn't quite ready, Brian. I was talking to Dale about his soybeans. It's like, you know, they're coming along. The corn's going to start to tassel. It looks like it could be a good year for harvest. I'm not talking about farming. I'm saying that Jesus says there's a harvest out there already. Will we go out to the fields? Will we get out of the house and air conditioning and set down our lattes and all these different things? Will we go out and do the work that Christ has called us to do. Are we sincere and desiring enough to be close to Christ to do the things that He asks? We're going to flip to Job 1. We talked about two men. David was one. David almost hit rock bottom by his choices. Oftentimes it's by our choices that we find ourselves where we're at. But Job is different. Job is going to be tested by God and almost come to rock bottom. So in Job 1... I think I'm going to start in verse 13. 
I, I've shared this before. If you think you've had a bad day, if you've been throwing pity parties and inviting all your friends because you had a bad day, you listen to Job's day. And you'll find out your day was quite blessed. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Have you hit rock bottom yet? Where would you be? Under the table, crying, sucking your thumb in a fetal position? I think I would. While he was still speaking, oh, could you imagine? Not another servant coming through the door. Came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Most of us probably would have hit rock bottom. Everything that we loved, everything that we cherished, everything that society would say, you got all these sheep and all these camels. I mean, you are a rich, rich man. All these things are removed from him because God allowed Satan to test him. Sometimes we walk through a test. Now, we've shared this word test. If you talk about it in the Greek terms, test does not mean like sitting in math class and the teacher says, I'm going to give you a 25-page test on math. The testing, what the Bible talks about is God already knows what's on the inside and he wants you to bring it onto the outside. To take a math test, they want to know what you've got on the inside because they don't know. God knows the gifts he's given us. And so he wants to use the test to bring it on out of us. Because if you'll remember, it was Satan that said, let me have my hand in him. Let me have my hand. You've been protecting him. You have all kinds of you know, protection around him. Let me remove all that stuff and he'll curse you. There's no doubt about it. He was testing him. And so when Job says, you know what? Praise the Lord. Blessed it be. It came out of him. His true integrity with God. I tell you, that takes some maturity in your relationship with God. That takes true trust. True trust, but is that rock bottom? Did he hit rock bottom yet? <clears throat> no. Satan begins to tell him, you know what? It, it, sure, I took his stuff and he lived through that, but let me touch his body. Let me get a hold of that guy. Let me just do everything I want to that guy, and he'll curse your name. God says you can do anything you want to his body. Just don't kill him. How many of you want to sign up for that mission field? Absolutely. No hands went up on that one. So Satan gets a hold of him, and what's he do? He puts boils on him. Boils from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. As he hit rock bottom, verse 9 talks about his wife. His wife says this, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. You ever have loved ones kind of poo-poo you or loved ones that kind of cast you off and say, you know, you're either, either because you're serving God or you're in love with Christ, they say, oh man, I want to do that stuff. You are crazy, you Bible thumper. Or for whatever reason, you're not cool enough, you're not rich enough, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough. Whatever it might be, have you ever been persecuted and set aside? When your spouse does it in the midst of this moment, can you imagine? Can you imagine? But he's still not at rock bottom. He's got three friends that come to him and they all say, it's because you've sinned, Job. You've got to repent to God. It's because you've sinned that all these things come upon you. And God later tells those guys, you're wrong. Then he has a friend come and he says, you know what, it's, it's not that. He said, you just gotta, you know, you've got to repent. You've got to do all these things. You've, you've got to get to God and you've just got to do these things because, again, you've done something wrong and he's not right either. He was tested. He was tested. 
So many times we worry about what Satan might do to us. Oh, Satan's out there and he's got a big stick. He's got this big hammer. He wants to hit me on top of the head. He's always lurking, trying to get a hold of me. It's so all this and that. But God might come and test you. And you might still have the same reaction or the same impact. And you might find yourself heading towards rock bottom. The hope is that we get to bedrock. Job never lost his trust in God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can examine yourself for a moment. I sure did. Could I have handled it that way? Losing one thing might be something that we struggle with. But losing everything. Your whole entire family. But if you read the rest of the story, you realize that God brought back that and more. Abundantly. He gave him that abundant life back. We strive that we can handle it better. For me, when I was suicidal, I was lacking God. Satan wanted to get me into the rocks. He wanted to, to bury me. There was a problem taking place in my life, and he wanted to destroy me with that problem. I truly believe he set it up. I talked about the governor of Texas. He's in a wheelchair. Bizarre accident. He's running. That's why I don't run. It's dangerous. He's running, and a tree falls on him. Now, you picture the timing of that. Let's say a 150-year-old oak, and you're running, and if he runs a little faster, he probably misses it. Runs a little slower, he probably misses it. But at that very moment, the tree comes down and crashes on him and paralyzes him forever. He should have hit rock bottom. But he said, it's the best thing that ever happened to me because it drew me near to Christ and what's important in this world. Oof. Wow. Could I say that? Could I say that, or would I hit rock bottom, or would I climb up on that bedrock, that solid rock? I'm going to talk for a second about Vernon. He doesn't know this. His wife, Christy, has MS, right? For how many years? 20-some years. I guess they could all roll over and die. They could all curse God and die. And it's a struggle some days. Vernon and I have talks. Christy and I have talks. Because how many of you know that if one person in your family has MS, the whole household does? It affects everybody. There's loss and there's grief. There's worry and concern and constant changes and people coming into your home to help and all these different things. And there's times you feel like you're at rock bottom, right? But you know what? These guys bounce back with Christ. Christy usually has a smile on her face. I'm sure Vernon can tell me times she has it. To me, anyway, she's pretty upbeat. She's striving to do the best she could. She's striving to make the most of a life in a wheelchair. Just had a, a grandson born a couple months ago. Her daughter got married a couple years ago or so. His son got married now. The family's kind of growing. When they come home, the farm's kind of coming alive, and Vernon's trying to get used to that. Pretty quiet over there otherwise. They are not rock bottom. Maybe some days they were. You hear bad news. You hear those things. You can hit rock bottom, but with Christ, you rebound. You rebound and you get up off the rocks. He wants us to soar. He wants us to climb. He wants us to move forward. He wants us to head towards the light. Satan's the one that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So if you're living your spiritual life, is it alive and well? Is it functioning? Is there a heartbeat? Can you say, you know, it is well in my soul? Or is your spiritual life and your spiritual walk with God hit rock bottom? You stroll in here and you stroll out and you stroll back in next week. That's the only touch of God you have. I pray that you want to change that. I pray for a hunger in your soul that says, you know what? I want my spirit to grab hold of Jesus Christ and I want a transformation in who I am. Create in me a clean heart, but transform me, Lord, by the renewing of my mind. Because where my mind is right now is not where it should be. Because I'm okay with rock bottom. Most of us would not want a surgeon that's on rock bottom. We would not want a house built by someone that's on rock bottom. We would not want to go to a restaurant where the cook and the waitress are on rock bottom. We expect more than that. We demand more than that. But when it comes to our spiritual walk... Jesus Christ comes off that cross and we're willing to take rock bottom. It's not what Christ has for us. That's not the abundant life. So I encourage you 
to say, you know what, I draw a line. This is it. I've said this 58 times. Every sermon I say, I'm not going to do this this week, but Lord, I'm going to surrender myself to you. I cannot do it under my own power. I surrender. I'm a prideful man no more in this area. I give it to you, Lord, and ask that you take it and build it up to what you want me to be. Last Sunday, I hauled out Betsy and Pebbles, the last of my two big cows, had a huge herd dispersal. All we have is the two calves. The two calves had not been happy this week because I weaned them. And they bawled and they bawled and they bawled. I felt bad. It's just part of the process. But they cried and they cried until they were so hoarse they could barely bawl anymore. Because I weaned them and they wanted, they wanted what I weaned them from. Here's the stickler. We as human beings often wean ourselves from Christ. Why aren't we crying out to Him? I want Him. I want Him. I want what He has for us. Bow your heads and close your eyes. As you have your eyes closed, I want to read you some verses. I just want you to absorb the verses. Matthew 19 and 26 says, But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. If you are on the bottom of the ground, if you're in the rock piles, you hit rock bottom, nothing's impossible. He can help you up out of it if you're willing to let him help you. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. By accepting Jesus Christ and his gift, he can give you complete victory and abundant life. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. These things can help us get off the rocks, to rise up, to be what Christ has born us to be, to be disciples for Him, to live a wonderful, abundant life, to be the better husband, the better wife, the better children, to not make the same mistakes, to give it to Him and say, God, all my decisions run through You now, through Your Word. If we'll just take the time and effort, I guarantee you, You will rise. You'll rise higher than you've ever been before. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone that sits here tonight. Heavenly Father, I pray that you place a hunger in them, that the Holy Spirit moves in them, Lord Jesus. Lord, you give us the great comforter. Comfort us so that we can focus on you, Lord. Encourage us, Holy Spirit, to be in the Word. Encourage us, Lord, to be in prayer. Encourage us, Lord, to not settle anymore for being on rock bottom. We're co-heirs with Christ. Christ is not on the rock bottom. But he's higher and higher and higher than the eagles. The eagles have to look up to see Jesus Christ. So I pray this for everyone here tonight, Lord. Give them the hunger. Don't allow it to dissipate. Don't allow it to disappear as they leave here. I ask this, Lord, that we can have victory for you so that we can be about doing more to help people have victory in you. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Everybody says? Amen, amen and amen. Hey, next week, next Sunday, July 23rd at 10 o'clock, uh, the Cowboy Church does the uh, Cowboy Church service over at the East Ottertail County Fair in Burn. Um, this year, uh, Ron and, the, and uh, Sherry and the gang is going to be doing the music over there. I'll share a word. What's cool is, is people come and we sit together and we have a great time. And then right across the tar road is a pancake stand. <laughs> and so oftentimes we have pancakes and sausage afterward and just fellowship together. So if you want to come down and have an enjoyable morning, 10 o'clock next Sunday at the East Artail County Fair, it's free. Um, it's early, it's like, you know, they haven't charging or anything, so it's easy to come down. It's not packed as far as parking and those sort of things. And then also the following Sunday on the 30th, right? The 30th of July, the Haining family will be here on Sunday evening. We're going to have a night of worship with the Haining family. I encourage you to invite someone. We're talking about discipleship and trying to help people come to know Christ. It is a very calm, easy way to appeal to their soul, their entertainment side, but then they receive the Word of God. And maybe we can get them to come back again for a service, and before long they'll come to know Jesus Christ. So it's a great, easy opportunity, but it's going to be packed. If it's like last year, it's going to be packed. So keep that in mind about your time. Some of you guys come at like two minutes to six. Way out there. Maybe on the deck out there. I don't know. Just keep that in mind. So that'll be at church service, six o'clock. And then, oh, if anyone, yes. 
We're going to have snacks afterwards like usual. If anyone would like to make any kind of cookies or bars or anything, talk to Sandy. Um, we just want to serve something simple, bars and cookies or cookies only or whatever, uh, just to be able, hospitable to the guests that we have that want to stay afterwards. Anything else? You guys can come up if you want. Anything else right off the top? By, um, VBS is coming up August 12th and 13th. We have 27 kids uh, lined up for this coming Bible study and VBS time. And remember on that Sunday, then they put on the program the songs that they've learned to do, things like that. they got some pretty cool stuff going on this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. So talk, you know, if there's any way you can help with that somehow or ever, talk to uh, the better girls for sure, and, and they can maybe plug you in. Or Do you need anything yet, or do you have a list of anything? Beef tongue? Okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah. There's a list in back with a few things that maybe still need to be filled. Spam is already taken. Kids love that, so keep that in mind. <laughs> so then that, we're going to sing Happy Trails. God bless you all. Happy Trails to you Until we meet again Happy Trails Happy Trails to you Go downstairs, there's all kinds of goodies, and spend some time in fellowship.